What's up, Thrive Fam? CJ Finley here again with another episode of the Thrive on Life podcast. And today I'm very excited for this conversation because it's a topic that hits home with me about not drinking alcohol. It's something that going into March, it'll be 19 months for me. And across from me right now, I have Mr. Bardia Rez, who has been helping a ton of people do the same thing. And I'm very much looking forward to getting you some information that if you're somebody that has thought about giving up alcohol, reducing your alcohol, alcohol consumption, uh, this is the man that you want to talk to. So before we get into it, I just love to thank you for showing up here today and how are you doing? Thank you, CJ. I appreciate you uh, inviting me out, man. It's great to be here. Yeah, let's get right into it. I was looking at your website and found a bunch of people that have listed reviews of working with you. And it gave me a feeling because as somebody who's coached people in the past and has worked with a lot of people, it always feels good to know that you're leaving an impact and to see it leaves an even another layer of, wow, this is, this is pretty cool what I'm getting to do. And I just wanted to spotlight you uh, because this person gave me a feeling where he or she goes, happy new year. I've, I'm so happy to say I've been sober since I started my program with Bardia back in August. It's so crazy. I'm so happy with my choice. I still go out with my friends, make mocktails, even, uh, popped some non- non-alcoholic champagne for New Year's. It used to be so hard to go a weekend without drinking, but I trusted the program and just knowing I'm not alone in the whole thing was so uplifting. The support is amazing because not drinking can be lonely, but not drinking will make you so proud of yourself and the clear mind is 100% better than waking up with anxiety and depression. Anyways, like Bardia always reminded me, take one day at a time, that's all you have to do. So the first question I wanted to ask you here today was, when she mentioned take one day at a time, it's something that I've heard in the past and probably a lot of other people have heard in the past. What does it mean to Barty and and what he's helping people with? What does that one day at a time attitude mean to you? Yeah, man, that's a great question. I'm, I'm glad that you started with that because I think like in this space, right? Like when people are starting this journey of like quitting drinking, they hear of the term one day at a time, especially like in the AA sort of recovery community. But it's like, what does that really mean? And so what I've come to understand is that, dude, with when it comes to sobriety, um, anybody who really develops a problematic relationship with alcohol, whether you call it alcohol use disorder or alcoholism, early on in the process, you really have to take it one day at a time, meaning that your only commitment, your only goal, your only focus is that you're just not going to drink today. You don't have to think about what's going to happen tomorrow tomorrow. What about Friday? How am I going to make it through this weekend? What about this vacation I have planned? What about this wedding? What about my friend's baby shower? What about, you know, my birthday and the trip or whatever else, right? Like if you start trying to, if you've developed a problematic relationship with alcohol and it's kind of woven its tentacles into every aspect of your life, it's become the primary coping mechanism for stress. It's woven into, you know, your weekends and your social circle. And, and it's it's kind of digged its, its claws into your life. Trying to imagine a life without alcohol is very emotionally overwhelming, right? And that emotional overwhelm will prevent people from ever getting started and taking that first step. So really, when, you know, somebody is just beginning this journey or has held up the mirror Uh, to their life and has really begun to audit their relationship with alcohol and has discovered that like, hey, this thing is like, it's doing more harm than good. It's damaging more, it's damaging me more than it's giving me. And I kind of want to start moving away from this thing. The thought and idea of just giving it up for forever is just too much. So the idea of one day at a time is that like, hey, if you want to stop drinking, just get through today without drinking, figure out Whatever you have to do, whatever you have to put in place, whatever tools, strategies, who you have to call to just get through the next 24 hours. And if you can do that, if you can do it one day, you can do it two days. If you can do it three days, you can probably go a week. If you can go a week and you've done that day in and day out, you can probably go 30 days. And if you can go 30 days, you can go 90 days. If you can go 90 days, you can go six months. If you can go six months, you can go a year. And so the idea is to to break down things into 24 hour increments, because no matter what happens, how stressed out you are, you know, like what curveball life throws at you, you can get through a day without drinking. 
right? And and then to extrapolate on that philosophy even more is that like, as you begin this journey of removing alcohol from your life, now you don't have anything to numb out and you don't have anything to run to when you're experiencing stress or frustrations or problems. And so a lot of our, a lot of like the, 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 um, suffering that we experience happens in our mind, right? When we're either thinking about the past or projecting out into the future. And so it's like, just bring yourself back to the present moment. If you're experiencing challenges, if you've got this problem in your life, like one day at a time also is a powerful philosophy to be like, listen, you can only handle what you can handle right now in the present moment with your two hands. And so if you're in your mind, bring yourself back to the present moment, breathe. And what's the next right step forward that you can take? And it's the idea really of like taking complex problems and breaking them down into individual steps. And if you can do that, focus on the present moment, take the next right step forward, you can really accomplish anything. It's something that I think also plays into, okay, that person that has gone seven days a week, a month, a year, and they slip up. Where does the the one step at a time mentality help those types of people? Because I think the biggest thing for me when I think about not even just alcohol, but anything, when you're going into like college and you're like, I got four years it's very overwhelming to think about that. And then you slip up in certain ways. But I have found that the beauty of when you slip up, the one day at a time mentality is like, I can forget that day and like just focus on today. Have you found that to be the same with the people that you've worked with? Like, there's not gonna, it's not gonna be perfect. So does that one day at a time mentality also help the people that are kind of slipping a little bit? Yeah, man, that's a great point. Um, the way I say, the way I like to describe like sobriety or being alcohol free is that it's not a light switch. It's not an on or off process for most people. It's a learning process. So if you want to go alcohol free, you have to learn how to live alcohol free and being alcohol free. Isn't just about not drinking. And I say this all the time in my content and my podcast, like quitting drinking or removing alcohol from your life basically has nothing to do with alcohol. Alcohol is like 1% of it. Really, it's the process of returning home to yourself to begin addressing the root cause of why you were numbing out, why you felt like you needed alcohol in the first place, learning how to move through that pain, move through that discomfort, reinvent yourself, reinvent your, your self-image, change the way that you manage your emotional state, change your internal dialogue in your relationship with yourself. But going back to like, does one day at, apply, one day at a time apply to people who slip up? Um, it... It does. Um, and, you know, somebody who slips up or, or relapses, the way I look at it is it's, it's not a failure. What it is, is it's, it's, it's data, it's feedback. So if you, if you slip up, if, if you've got seven days sober, 10 days sober, 30 days sober, and you're really trying to be alcohol free, and then you slip up, then it's like, okay, let's examine what happened. Where were you? What was the trigger? What were you feeling? How did you rationalize it? What were the tools that you had at your disposal that you didn't exercise? What could you have done instead? Um, could you have made decisions prior to you being in that position that could have maybe not put you in that position? So really it's just like, it's feedback, right? And as long as you can learn from that and you know apply the, the things that you need to learn so that you're better off next time around, then you're still moving forward, right? If you were drinking four or five days a week, but then you go 30 days and you only drink one, well, now you've only drinking one out of 31 days and that's, that's forward progress. The way I look at this is like, I explain it like a stock chart, right? So if you zoom out on the one year stock chart, it's gonna be an upward trajectory, right? But if you zoom into the, let's say the one month candle or the 24 hour candle or even the one hour candle or even the one minute candle, you're gonna have all these ups and downs. Right. And like learning how to live alcohol free where you're independent from substances that augment your mind, your emotional system. It's basically like, you know, as an adult, it's learning how to relive in your body. Right. It's like it's like you're 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 this conscious awareness. You're this being that that has a mind and you have this body and there's all these programs and patterns that are running. And a lot of these programs and patterns are uncomfortable from your past and your childhood and trauma and everything else. 
And if you've adapted from the ages of 15 to 25 or 15 to 30 to every time you feel a little bit of discomfort in social situations, after work, when you're stressed out or tired, in your relationships, whatever else it might be, you turn to alcohol and that you know eases your discomfort temporarily. When you choose to be alcohol free, like you now have to feel all of those things. There's no more running. There's no more numbing. And that is a learning process, right? If you've adapted your life for 5, 10, 15 years, you know, to, to take this drug, to augment the way that you feel, um, it's going to take a little bit of time. So have, you know, I encourage everybody to really have compassion with themselves because it really is a learning process. I think it's a brilliant visualization, not just for what we're talking about here today, but engineering your environment is so powerful for anything that you're trying to do in life. And I love how you list it out. If you do slip up or whatever you're defining as a mistake on your path, what actually led to that? And that's where I'd love to dig in a little bit for you is those that can help the most in our world are those that have struggled with it themselves and have unlearned certain things themselves. And going through your story and seeing that you lost your father at a young age and some other traumatic events that have happened in your life, that's not easy to unlearn some of the things that you're talking about. So I'd love to just give you the open floor to speak on your story. And when did alcohol start becoming a problem in your life? Who did it impact? Where did it take you? And what were some of the things that you've had to unlearn over that process? And feel free to just go with that. Cool, man. Yeah, so, um, dude, alcohol has been like kind of the centerpiece of my life from from the time I was born, you know? So my story goes back to, you know, my family. So I, I grew up in a really crazy dysfunctional family, and my dad was an alcoholic, and um, the only time I really knew him sober was like Saturday mornings. He'd take me, you know, once a month to get my hair cut. But pretty much every single day he was drinking and he would drink a lot, you know. And so anything that you could almost imagine in, in let's say, alcoholic or, you know, substance abuse based like family, like I experienced it. Uh, everything from like not feeling connected, you know, emotional neglect. There was a lot of like verbal abuse. My dad would get really angry. I'd wake up multiple times per night with like cops coming to the door because he'd be raging, like all of it, you know, there's substance abuse, like with my sisters. And so it was just a really crazy deal, you know? Um, and as I've dove into the world of coaching and trauma and understanding the human operating and system and stuff like that, it's like not the ideal environment, lots of adverse childhood experiences. But anyways, like I feel like I made the best of it throughout that period. Like I played outside a lot. I skated a lot. Um, and then like around 12 years old, um, is when shit like really started to hit the fan with my family. My mom tried committing suicide and, and ate a bunch of pills at home, you know, hospital, like ambulance came, rushed her to the hospital. I thought she was going to die. Like that was super crazy. And then when I was 14, my dad died of alcohol poisoning in his sleep. And that was like pretty crazy and pretty traumatic. And, um, you know, at that time, my uncle came down to help with the funeral. And um, he gave me this book by this guy named Wayne Dyer. You may have heard of Wayne Dyer. He's like a spiritual guru. And the book was called You'll See It When You Believe It. And he's like, here, read this. And I, I read my first personal development book at 14, right when my dad passed away. And that like completely shifted my paradigm and sent me down a new trajectory in life. Um, you know, a lot of people don't discover like personal development type stuff until like their twenties or whatever. But like I read that at 14, it, it completely shifted my paradigm and it introduced me to the concept of like your consciousness and your beliefs influence your reality. And just this whole nother side, like it was, I, you know, when you're 14, like you really don't know your ass from your elbow, you know? And so that like, right when that happened, that sent me down this deep rabbit hole of like studying personal development and spirituality and philosophy and just that whole side of things. And like, by the time I was 20, I'd, re I'd read like basically like every major personal development book. And, um, anyways, like, you know, my, my dad passes away and, you know, this, this guy comes into my life. His name is Sean. He was dating my sister at the time. And uh, he kind of becomes like my older brother, almost like father figure 
smart dude, still like one of my close mentors today. Um, and I'm super grateful for that experience that really helped kind of shape me. But, you know, alcohol comes into play. So first time I got drunk, I think I was maybe 13 or 14, had like 10, 15 shots, just terrible. Worst experience of my life. Then I get into high school, sophomore year, start partying. And pretty much the first time I picked up alcohol, I became a binge drinker. I couldn't just have one. I was one of the people where the way alcohol interacts with my dopamine is once I have one, it sets off a cascade and I can't stop drinking until I get sick um, or I get super drunk. And from the beginning, like I, I knew it was a problem, right? I had seen what addiction and drugs had done to my family. And so there was so much guilt and shame that came with alcohol. Every time I drank the day after I told myself I'm never drinking again, but I was such a fiend for the dopamine. Like I just, I fucking loved it, you know? And so, and, and, and it tore me because you know, right as I start drinking in like, you know, 15 to 20, half of my personality is like super focused on personal growth, you know, fulfilling my potential. Like I'm, I'm just all the, the data I'm taking in is like personal growth stuff. And so half of my personality is super into just bettering myself. I want to be successful, all that. The other half of me is just stuck like Groundhog Day, reliving the same week of my life over and over again. I was like a high functioning binge drinker really in shape. I played football on the outside. You probably wouldn't have known. You're just like, oh, Barty likes to party, right? But inside, it was just robbing me and destroying my soul. Fast forward, you know, from 15 to 29, I'm, I'm pretty much like a high-functioning binge drinker. And again, on the outside, a lot of people will be just like, Barty loves to party. But it was just like, it was robbing me. Every single time I drank, I knew it was like, it's, it's limiting my potential. It's the only thing holding me back. I'd make three steps of progress forward through the week and then five steps back. I would drink so much Friday and Saturday. You know, my hangovers would last till Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday, Friday, I start feeling better again, back at it, you know? And so this goes on and, you know, I'm still high functioning. I'm taking care of my shit. Like I'm starting businesses. I had a supplement company, a marketing agency, but like alcohol is just like ruining me. Pandemic hits. And, you know, you start working from home, you lose all sense of accountability, the world is in disarray, everybody's freaking out. And I just start, alcohol consumption starts to increase, I start drinking every day. And at my worst, I, I got up to four to six bottles of wine a day and a pack of cigarettes a day. And I ran that script for, I don't know, five, six months. And I was just absolutely like destroying myself, like everything was breaking down mentally, emotionally, my body. Um, and it was just super unsustainable. Finally, you know, one day, you know, I'm drinking and my buddy invites me out to the pool and, uh, he challenges me to a race and I'm like a really fast swimmer. I've, I've always beat everybody I've raced against. And I was like, yeah, let's do it. So we start racing and I am drinking at this point, six months, my body has like been broken down. I dislocated my left shoulder in high school football. And so it was still wasn't like 100%. And while I'm swimming super aggressively, my left shoulder like rips out of its socket and like severely like dislocates and is like mangled. And it's like the most excruciating pain of my life. And it was out for like 10 minutes. And I'm like under the water. I can't get up out of the water because the buoyancy is the only thing that's like stabilizing it. Finally, it pops in after 10 minutes. And in that moment, like I, I just... I just had an awakening. I was like, this would not have happened if I was drinking, you know, like this pain, you know, this can't go on anymore. And I was 29 at the time and I had just gotten an opportunity to work, um, with this, with, with these coaches and like that opportunity was really special to me. And so like, I just, I kind of ran through everything in my life. I was 29. I was a few months away from turning 30 and I knew I was a universe away from the person I knew I was capable of being. And the only thing that was ever holding me back in my life, the only thing that would take me back was alcohol. So in that moment, I made what seemed like the absolute scariest, most terrifying decision of my life. And I'm like, I'm, I'm giving this thing up. Like, because the pain is real at this point. I can't weasel my way out of it. I can't deny it. I can't lie to myself. Like I could viscerally feel it. It was 10 out, 20 out of 10. And at the same time, I had this vision for my future. I had, I've like, 
all that personal growth, all that study of philosophy, of consciousness, of mindset, of like, there was, I, I had this vision of who I could be and I, I knew I am. And I knew that alcohol was the only thing. So there's two things I kept in mind. One was the pain and the other one was the vision for who I could be. And, you know, shortly after I, I moved out to Austin, Texas, I became a coach and started stop drinking coach last year. And that's, that's the story. Now we're here. Now we're here. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. Super powerful, uh, relatable in certain aspects. I'm sorry you had to go through some of those things. If you could ask your dad a question today, oh, what would you ask him? I've never been asked that before. Because I, one reason I asked that question is my, my wife lost her father to a tragedy and there's moments in our life where we're just, I, I can just feel, I know she would just love to just ask something, whatever, whether you're, you're if you're listening to this, you're, the person you lost was good, bad, and different in your eyes. As life goes on, it's just having the ability to have answers from that person mm. it is really powerful. So when you were telling that story, um, you know, you like, he doesn't get to see you at this moment and, and conquering what I like to call slaying dragons, um, personal dragons. And you don't get to ask him that or have that, I would say, uh, clarity on that relationship. So if you could, and that was something that you were able to do, what would that look like? Yeah. You know, it's interesting, like, the reason I feel so called to be doing the work that I'm doing and I feel so aligned, like I, I was born for this, like everything, every, like I've been able to look back on my past and th synthesize it and interpret it in, in, in such a way where every painful experience and trauma and tragedy was so divinely perfectly placed and timed and ordered for me to be here right now speaking with you, sharing the energy through my voice to this podcast and distributing it to the person who needs to hear it. And the one thing my dad always told me when he'd be drinking every night, like he would have this conversations with me, he would just hammer into my head. He would say, you have so much potential, my son, while he'd be like drunk and crying. And that just stuck with me. That has been this like this tape playing in the back of my head. And so the work that I'm doing now is the process of fulfilling that potential, that vision and that dream that he had, like that, that energy that he gave me. So I think that I'd have two questions for him. One would be, I want to know if him dying was an accident or if he kind of did it on purpose. Like, did he drink himself to death knowing that he's like, hey, this is how I'm going to go and I'm just going to drink extra tonight? Or was it an accident? I'd be curious to know that. And the second thing would be, I'd really love to know what his pain was and why he, you know, because that's why we drink. There's an internal pain, there's an internal dysregulation ment mentally or emotionally. So I, I wish I knew what that was from him because I, I really looked at him as such a powerful, strong man because he was, when he wasn't drinking, he was incredibly generous, incredibly kind. You know, he didn't make much money at all, but like he, he was just so generous, so kind. And so I, I would love to know what that pain was. Is your uncle still around? Yeah. Why did he give you that book in that moment? I don't know. I don't know, but I've been meaning to, I haven't connected with him since this like last year with all this stuff, but like I've been meaning to connect with him and like let him know that that move altered the trajectory of my life and indirectly has altered the trajectory and lives of millions of people who I've impacted. Yeah, that that's one of the reasons I asked that question was Steve Jobs has a saying like, it's easy to connect the dots when you're looking backwards. And when you said that he handed you this book, 
what I'd love to know what was going through his mind when he handed you when he handed you that book. Did he know what like so the, he was, the ripple effect that that could have, and what maybe that book had had a ripple effect on him, or I don't know. But I I know he was very spiritual. He was like very into Wayne Dyer. He was very into like spirituality. He wasn't religious, but um, he's like a very humble person, very into spirituality. And so I think his intention was like, you know maybe this will help guide him. Maybe this will provide some solace, some support, some meaning to help them help him process this, this experience of, of losing, losing his father. Yeah. That's, that's so intriguing. Um, I, I need to read this book. This, it's multiple times I've heard about this book. So I, I need to get this into my personal library. I'm going to switch gears a little bit. We were talking a little bit about high functioning and people being high functioning, binge drinkers, alcoholics, just not really recognizing necessarily that they even have a problem. How does somebody understand that it's creating a problem in their, in their life before it gets to a point, like a breaking point, where their shoulder is popped out mm. in a pool? Is it possible? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, the fundamental process there is you have to be honest with yourself and you have to develop the self-awareness to really be able to look at cause and effect in your life. The reason it's so hard to do with alcohol, there's several reasons. One, it's the, the social conditioning, right? We have all been socially conditioned since birth through music and movies and media and television and all of our heroes drinking and all the lead actors drinking and, and the, you know, like, and then your parents drink and they're having a great time and, and wine is sophisticated and you see commercials of people drinking alcohol on the beach. Like that's the end game when you retire. It's so that you can relax and finally drink, you know? Um, and then you go through, you know, a, a high school and a college system where, there's no education and understanding around what alcohol is and what it's doing to your brain and how it's augmenting your reward center and neurochemistry. And then, you know, you get a, a basically a five year, four year degree in becoming in developing alcohol use disorder. And then, you know, your twenties are really designed, you know, the social hierarchical value system is like socializing and having fun is at the top. Like it's, it's like a matrix, like this, this three dimensional reality that we live in. And, and there's a lot of conditioning around it. So people don't see alcohol as a drug, right? They don't, you like, I compare it to cocaine and heroin and people probably lose their mind over it. But it's like, dude, a drug is a substance that augments the way that you feel, that augments your neurochemistry. And people who can't accept the fact that alcohol is a hard drug, like it, just because it's legal and you, and you, and you buy, and you buy into the, to the, the, the cognitive bias that because somebody else, the medical establishment, laws, government have made it legal, it must be okay. It must be okay for consumption or else why would they, why would like, why would they have it at the liquor store? Why could anybody just go buy it? Right. So it's like, you have to be able to think and see past that. Right. So one is the, the social conditioning. The second part is, is the way that alcohol interacts with your brain. So alcohol activates the reward center. And the reward center is a deeply primal, deeply biological system in your brain that is tied to our evolution and is tied to um, survival. So there's this there's there's this um, addiction and neuroscience video I watch, and the guy's like, it's neuroscientist. He's like, the three most important things in life are food, water, and dopamine. So when you drink alcohol, it floods your brain with dopamine, and dopamine is a neurotransmitter that is incredibly sensitive and is tied to uh, reward, pleasure, motivation, and euphoria. The reason we are here and we've made it this far in our evolution is because of dopamine. So when you activate this reward center, it's sending, and this isn't happening consciously, like you're not choosing this, it's sending a signal to every cell of your being to say, do more of that it's like the jackpot's going off because dopamine gets released when we have sex and when we eat food. 
and we acquire resources or we make forward progress towards something meaningful that it, again, everything just goes back to like survival and, and evolution. So it's very counterintuitive because when you drink alcohol, it, it is like the jackpot going off in your brain. It increases dopamine three to four X above baseline. We're not, and, and I'll kind of break down the, the, uh, the neuroscience so you can get an understanding. So on average, we have about 50 nanograms per deciliter of dopamine floating in our brain, average person. If you get fired from your job or life throws a major curveball at you that absolutely blows, like that's going to drop your dopamine down to 40, right? So imagine how, how much motivation drops when you just hear you just lost your job or something fucked up happened. Okay. From 50 to 40. Now, if you're clinically depressed and you can't get out of bed, like you literally can't sit up, your dopamine's at a 10, okay? Now, on the flip side, when you're having amazing sex and you're eating your absolute favorite food, dopamine is at like 90 to 95, so almost double baseline. When you drink alcohol, it increases dopamine to like 190 to 200, so human beings are not meant to experience a normal, natural day-to-day -day life, anything above your absolute favorite food and sex. But alcohol is, is doubling that. Now, consciously, you understand that like alcohol is, is actual carcinogen. Like ethanol gets converted to acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde is a carcinogen that damages your DNA, kills your cells, ages you, like Con connected to 200 different like cancers and diseases, but your brain doesn't care because your conscious mind is like the last one to the party. You've got a profound supercomputer that's running the show and you're like the last one to, to realize what's good. So it's very counterintuitive because when you drink, it makes you feel really good and you, you just conveniently forget about the second and third order consequences down the line. So the question, long, long-winded technical answer for, you know, how do you know if, if alcohol has become problematic before you hit rock bottom? You just have to develop the self-awareness to be like, okay, has alcohol gone from a totally take it or leave it, moderate relationship where I can just have one or two, maybe three, feel the buzz, know my limit and stop, and not think about it for a few weeks or a month and just go on and do my thing? Has it crossed that invisible line or boundary to where now alcohol is a thing? I'm like tethered to it. It's part of all my social experiences. I feel like I can't socialize without alcohol. I'm turning to alcohol as a way to augment the way that I feel when I'm stressed out or frustrated or hurt or sad. Is it like a thing now? And if it's become a thing, like that's the first sign. That's the first sign that like, okay, something is potentially going on here. And the way that what people have to understand about alcohol is that it's only a matter of time because what you're dealing with is a sensitive balance in your neurochemistry. And every time you flood your brain with dopamine, abnormally high levels, before it comes back down to baseline, it dips to the equal and opposite direction. And because you're pumping your brain through an exogenous substance, outside of you, flooding your brain with dopamine, your natural dopamine set point is gonna lower. So if you normally sit at 50, a year of drinking consistently three days a week, four days a week, whatever, you're gonna go down to 48 and then 45. And by the time you're 30, 35, if this has been your life, your natural dopamine set point's gonna be, I don't know, I don't know if these are the, the real numbers, but let's say for a thought experiment, like 30. And so now life is gonna be just a little bit more dull like social experiences and having fun and going on hikes and trying to be motivated and just to take care of shit that you have to take care of is going to require more effort. And the things that are important to you are going to slowly but surely start to take a back seat. And unless it involves alcohol, you don't really want to do it. And, and the alcohol starts to become more and more and more part of your life. And so if you're noticing that, that's where you really want to being like super honest with yourself and say, okay, let me play the tape forward. What's the trajectory here? If I can assume that this is only going to get worse because it will, it's progressive, right? You're dealing with a substance where there's hundreds of millions of gallons on the shelves 
So you can't win against the alcohol. You can't out drink your pain. You can't out drink your stress. Every time you drink, it's damaging you. It's damaging the sensitive balance of your neurochemistry and it's making you more dependent on it. And if you die and if you get cirrhosis of the liver or if you damage your relationships or if you lose your job or if you waste the most precious years of your life in your 20s and 30s when you're supposed to, let's say, be building and like, you know, enjoying your whatever it might be to alcohol, they, the companies don't care. If you get into a car accident, if your wife leaves you, if your kids, it, like, they don't care. They don't know. They don't care. And so you have to reflect and be like, what am I doing here? Why do I feel like I need alcohol? Why am I running to it? Why, why do I feel like I need to, to do this? And that typically for a lot of people is one of the first major points of like existential self-reflection because then it's like you have to examine why am I here on planet earth? What's my mission? What's my purpose? How do I want to live out my remaining years? What type of impact do I want to make? What type of career field do I want to have? Like, and you would, you would think that alcohol is unrelated, but it's completely related because we only have a limited amount of time. And if you're spending 20 to 30% of your time throughout the week on the weekends, on Friday to Sunday drinking, when this is supposed to be the time potentially reinvested back into yourself so that you can evolve and grow, but you're numbing out and then you're spending the other 70% like not super excited recovering from that poison, like just play the tape forward. You're not going to be able to evolve into the person that you're capable of being. And that's what alcohol represents. Like in a broader scale, when you wake up to see it for what it is, is it is the thing humans use to procrastinate against addressing the root cause of the thing that's driving them to drink. Alcohol is it like, and I say it in my podcast, and my, this might sound extreme, but it's a suicidal form of procrastination. Because there's a reason you're drinking, there's a problem. And if you're not addressing the problem, you're procrastinating against your own mental, emotional, and spiritual evolution. And that's why I say the journey of learning how to live alcohol-free is the most profound and powerful journey one can take. Because when you no longer have an out, when you no longer have a reason to say, oh, well, I was hungover, oh, I was drunk, like you are forced to confront who and what you are as a human being. And um, committing to that process, you can't imagine what's available to you on the other side when you, when you do it the right way long enough. So many threads I wanna pull from all that. There's two things. One, did you watch the Super Bowl? No. <laughs> Can you guess how many alcohol ads there were? I'm sure a lot. <laughs> they were the All most. All of them. Yeah, literally. I actually put out a tweet during the Super Bowl about how many, it infuriates me, how many fast food and alcohol ads are. So, and how nobody questions that. Like, we, we'll sit here, like, during the pandemic and, and, yell at each other over how we should go about life and, and what's healthy and what's not and protecting people and all these things. And then you have the most watched thing of the year. And we're talking about, I love how you mentioned how I believe it's like the worst drug as well. Um, not because I don't have as extreme view on it. Um, it's just more so I view it as the most extreme drug because of something that I deal with where it's, it literally starts so simply, like when something's very simple and, and easy to access, and then you get into this mindset of nothing kind of matters, that's very dangerous. Yeah. Meaning like having a beer in and of itself, like one beer is not dangerous. Sure. Like you're not gonna die from that no. beer. There's no risk of you dying from that beer, like unless you do something really stupid while you're drinking the beer. So it's very easy for people to be like, oh, I can just, a, four, a 12 year old could try a beer, right? But then you get to a bar and it's like, I have a couple of drinks, a couple of beers, I'm still okay. And then someone's like, oh, do you want a shot? And then because you now have this dopamine burst, like you were describing, and your inhibitions kind of lowered, you now can't say no. 
And that's really where I struggled the most in my life is when you're talking about potential, my, I thought about my potential all the time. It's what drove me to be a high achieving athlete and a high achieving scholar. But then as soon as I drank, the thoughts of those went away. Mm. Now, in the time frame that it was happening, it felt good because I couldn't turn my brain off. So it felt like a place that I could go where I could finally just not think. Right. I'd love your view and take on what is that place? Like why, why are we driving people to get to that place? Like what is the root cause of that? I have my personal, but if, if you've seen this or on a, on a whole scale, what is driving people to want to seek a place where they don't think? Yeah. When I look back, I, I'm almost upset with myself because now today, like I, I literally, my career is around thinking and like asking questions. <laughs> and I'm like, imagine if I hadn't sacrificed that time, what I would have done with my thoughts and what positive things I kind of brought to the world. So mm. it's kind of how it's impacted me like across the years and how, how many people like struggle with that. Yeah, that's a really good question, man. And so this is where I take a different perspective on this than like the traditional traditional 12 step a like recovery community is I look at addiction through like a, a trauma informed lens, right? So if within your sphere of consciousness, you are experiencing such an overwhelm of thoughts and emotion to where you like, you can't regulate it and all you want to do is shut it off. That's a result of trauma, mm. right? So I talk about like the human OS, the human operating system and why it's so important as part of our evolution as human beings, specifically as adults, you have to learn the human operating system. It's always blown my mind. And I've always had this like thought where it's like, if you go up to a hundred people and, and be like, CJ, tell me a little bit about how your brain works. Tell me about how your eyes work. Tell me how your stomach like processes food. Like nobody has any idea. Isn't it insane? Isn't it so wild that we inhabit this body? We're this conscious agent and we have this, this vehicle and almost 100%, like 99% of people will go through this entire existence never investigating the components of this supercomputer, of this machine to see what is this? What are our five senses? How do we take in data? What happens to it in our brain? What is the nervous system? How do you define feelings and emotions? Like, how do we architect meaning? What is the fabric of language? Like, there, there's so much to it. Um, I totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> what was the question? No, that's that's completely fine. Um, um, go, leaning in towards, like, why we want to... I liked where oh, you were going in the beginning. Okay, like, yeah, why? So, so taking the trauma-informed lens, right? Yeah. So between the ages of, like, 0 and 7, or 0 and 12, right, like... 80% of our relationship to ourself and our relationship to the environment, to the world, is basically templated in based off of our parents and the nurturing process. So we don't really have a choice in the matter. We don't have the cognitive capacity and the map of reality to make sense of why our parents treat us a certain way, why they're there for us or they're not there for us. So like... Who you are, your, your initial unconscious instinctual perceptions, beliefs, um, all of that is basically pre-programmed into you. And so as an adult, the evolutionary journey of evolving your consciousness and the way of waking up is to begin learning how to make the unconscious programs that are running your life conscious so that you get to decide how you want to feel about yourself and how you want to relate to the world. But most people don't really discover that and they'll live out their entire lives with the pre-programmed patterns of their early environments. So if you grow up with a ton of adverse childhood experiences and trauma, your nervous system is probably going to be in a state of fight or flight. 
your um, thoughts are probably going to be really anxious. You're probably not going to have a ton of self-confidence or self-esteem or self-worth. Your, um, you know, your, your belief in yourself and your ability to go out and execute, like all of these things become affected. And so like, if you look at our society, like there's no user manual, there's no blueprint to being a human being. So all these adults that we have that we call adults that, that you just kind of realize that they're just kind of kids in adult, <laughs> adult bodies, right? Like you're born into this family. You don't get to choose, you know, trauma and therapy, like that stuff really wasn't like established a ton into like the seventies. And so like our parents, like boomers, and then before them, like this whole mental health thing is like pretty new, mm -hmm. you know? So they were just doing their best. They were treating you the way they knew how based on the tools they had. You didn't get the love and safety and support and connection that you need, whatever. And then you go into high school and then you go into college and then you just become an adult. And at no point does anybody sit you down and they're like, hey, like, should we talk about like what happened? Like, are you good? Like, how do you feel about yourself? Like, do you feel empowered to go out and create your life? Like, and so what happens is when you have all these adverse experiences and all this trauma, it creates mental and emotional dysregulation. Anytime you experience trauma and do not have the resources to regulate your nervous system back down to safety and to cognitively process and make sense of the experience to return back to safety and homeostasis, it creates a separate part that lives inside of you. So that seven-year-old, five-year-old, eight-year-old, nine-year-old, 10-year-old that got bullied on the playground, that lives inside you. And think of it like putting on glasses. You're 30 years old, you're 35 years old, but you've got hundreds of other glasses on from every age. And so you're looking out into the world, like maybe as, as a 30 year old, like you've got this business that you're running and you're good in business, but when it comes to relationships, you're still operating as a seven year old. And so this process is like this way of waking up, understanding the human operating system, understanding how the brain works, the nervous system, the emotional system, becoming more mindful is this, the, the healing journey is about going through and, and getting to a place where you develop the courage to revisit those parts of yourself and to reprocess and reinterpret them and then reintegrate them back into, into yourself now. And if you can begin to do that and work through that journey, ideally we'll get to a place where there really isn't any more mental and emotional dysregulation and you feel connected to yourself, you feel whole, you love yourself, you appreciate yourself, you understand that you don't need things outside of yourself you know, through meditation, you discover that you are the source, you are the factory, you are the spring from which all experience emanates from. And that, you know, what you think the world is, is just a subjective projection of, of your own self. Like reality is a mirror, consciousness is a mirror. So why do we get to the place? Again, a long-winded technical answer. Maybe I just like hearing my voice. Why do we get to the place where, you know, we feel like we need to shut the, the, the thoughts off? It's because there's dysregulation inside us from trauma, right? Which wired us a specific way to be hyper anxious, to be hyper vigilant, to be constantly replaying the same experience over and over and over again. These are all trauma responses. I think right from the start, I mean, that was a, that was a great answer even just thinking back to my own life. And on a recent podcast, I was talking about how I'm, I've been working for a decade on responding to things rather than reacting to, yeah. to things. And even recognizing that we have these reactions based on the traumas of our past. And one of the reasons that I gave up alcohol in the first place is doing blood work and seeing the physical trauma that my liver had and it wasn't even necessarily because of drinking. I have celiac disease and other autoimmune diseases and seeing a clear metric of my body has this trauma. I'm not making this shit up in my head. Mm. And what am I doing about it? I'm making it worse. And that's when it like clicked in my head. Now for most people and like for much of my life, there was no metric. There was no like, you almost feel crazy that you think some of these thoughts and have some of these ways of being, but there's no metric to like, how bad is this or mm. where am I going with this? And most of my life was that because 
if you're high achieving and you're getting good grades and you're playing sports and most people look at you like, oh, he's an upstanding citizen, but deep down you just have this pain, you don't know how to regulate it. So I love how you use the word, the trauma and the dysregulation of it because that was literally my life where I didn't meditate. What was meditation? I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know what sauna and ice baths and red light and, and talking to other men about my problems was. So it reminds me of like giving grace in these conversations of around how this is a new thing. And that yeah. like just going back to the very beginning of this conversation of day one, like if you heard anything today that kind of piqued your interest, just follow that thread and just take one step at one time. Because for me, it wasn't, I didn't get to the point of like, I'm giving up alcohol today. It was like a process over years of yeah. questioning myself and like reevaluating, like what is the right way for me? Um, so I love everything you're talking about, but for the last uh, kind of like part of this podcast, I always like to go into what it is the guest is actually doing today so that I can hopefully connect you with somebody out there that I know you could have a massive impact on. So from a selfish standpoint, I'm a big brand guy and like building businesses and marketing. And I've seen you putting out tons of content um, and creating your own brand and, and making a name for yourself. What did that look like in the beginning though? Because I know it's a struggle for people to like get started when in terms of the, the business sense of things. Mm. And I've been there and I know a lot of people that are potentially there right now and I'm always one to encourage them to take that next step. So for you, how did you really get into thinking like, okay, I had this problem. I kind of been on this path of solving it for myself, but I really want to help other people solve that. What did the like first steps of that look like? Yeah, that's a great question, man. So <clears throat> when I moved out to Austin, I worked with this coaching company and I immersed myself in their system and then I became a coach. And like, you know, I think I discovered that I wanted to get into coaching when I was like 19 or 20, because at that point I'd been like immersing myself in just personal growth for four or five years. And it was just so deeply aligned with me that I was like, this just feels right, you know? Um, so right as I got sober, I worked in that coaching company and system and became a coach for like a year and a half, a year or so. And then I left them because I really wanted autonomy and I just, I wanted to separate off and do my own thing. And um, a few months later, like I just, I got on TikTok and I didn't really know what was gonna come out of it. I just, I was like, I'm just going to start talking into the camera and I'm just going to share personal growth mindset stuff because that just, that's me. Like, that's, Was your was your handle the stop drinking coach from no, day one or what no. was it? I think it was Barticus Maximus, which was like my <laughs> old Instagram name. So the very first video I put out was on Facebook ads and I was like, oh, mistakes that you're making. And I got like, I don't know, 1600 views. And I was like, oh, cool. You know, that's, that's awesome. And then I just started putting out, like, if you go to the very bottom of my TikTok, you can see him. I still have him there. Like I, I started putting out like, you know, why you should stop caring about what people think and just some different mindset, like philosophy stuff. And then a friend of mine came, came over and, you know, I got distracted. I was posting every day and then like a month goes by and then I post again and I get this video in my feed of this girl who's talking about sobriety. And I'm like, huh, okay. I haven't seen this on TikTok before I go into the comments and I see just a bunch of people are like, how did you do it? How'd you do it? Like, I need help. Like there's pain in the comment section. So I'm like, huh, let me, let me just post a video on, on sobriety. And I, I posted this video and it was like really silly. I was like at the pool, like you could see my feet and the pool was in front of me. And I put this like silly song behind it. And I was like five ways my life got better since I quit drinking. And it was just like text, 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 text. And that video got like 5,000 views in the first hour. And I'd never gotten 5,000 views before. And I was like, huh, that's, that's cool. And then like within a few hours, it was at like 25,000 views. And like by the end of the day, it was at like, I don't know, 40, 50,000 views. I get all these comments coming in. And at that point, I was like, what's, what's interesting is that like two months before that, so I'd been in digital marketing for 10 years before I got into coaching. And I just like, I made this like pact with myself, this like energetic, intentional choice that I was like, I'm done with marketing like, I'm tired of this. I'm going to get into something new. And so maybe I activated the reticular activating system, the RAS, and my brain was just tooled for it. But like, I was like, all right, I'm just going to follow the views. And so I just started posting more content about sobriety and people started asking questions in the comments and I started responding. 
and that content just was taking off. Like I was getting a lot of traction. And then once I got a thousand followers, I put a calendar link in my bio and people just started booking calls with me. And um, I love this. Yeah, man. It got to the point where my calendar was like so insanely full. And in the beginning, I was just talking to people like I was gathering data. And then, yeah, I just took on my first client. And I was like, hey, I'll help you figure out how to get sober the way I got sober and I'll coach you through this. And um, it was all history from there. Yeah, I mean, the so beauty it, of it entrepreneurship unfolded super organically. Yeah, the beauty of entrepreneurship: follow a thread, and then see where it goes, and then just listen to data and feedback. And you've been talking about this this whole time. You've been going into like the dopamine and thinking through what is happening to our brain and our body. Not even just with alcohol, but when we eat, when we sleep, when we do different things throughout the day. Understanding why it is that we have this supercomputer and how we can make it function better. What, what has been the biggest struggle of working with other people? Because it's not easy. It's not easy being a coach. It's, there's, a, there's a lot that goes into it. I think in today's world, everyone's like, I want to be a coach or I want to help people. I want to do this. Yeah. Like, it, it is a grind and, and it's a huge responsibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's, there's a lot of like emotional weight you know, because the field that I'm in and the people that I'm working with, it's like sobriety and like addiction, it's like, it's pretty complex, you know, and it's a multifaceted thing. So I take on like a tremendous amount of emotion from other people, but I feel like I'm tooled for it. Like I, I have a pretty strong like resilience and tolerance for being able to handle like a lot of emotional weight because like, it was just how I was tooled yeah. through the family system and everything like it was just, so I think that's the biggest thing. Um, so it's like just having a parameter of how much you can actually take on in a certain circumstance. So yeah. Knowing that. Yeah. Um, and so that's like, that's why it's incredibly important for me to like really stay on top of my game, you know, because like I'm leading a tremendous amount of people and there's a tremendous amount of people who are like looking to me and relying on me and depending on me for like my energy and my support. So I think it's that like just that system. We'll, we'll end here uh, before we get into the wrap up questions. What does that, what is pouring energy into yourself today look like so that you can give to the world? Is it reading books, listening to podcasts, going on walks? Like what is run us through like Bardia's, day in the life to make sure that he fulfills his cup so that he can then overflow into the world. Yeah. So it's just being really mindful of like my energy. So I have like a morning routine, cold shower and meditation. Um, I do sauna and ice bath a few days a week, work out every day. Um, I have a coach that I was working with. Um, and so I'm always learning, I'm always growing, I'm always expanding my map of reality, trying to connect all the dots together and synthesize it in a way so that I can make it more cohesive and understandable so that people can can shorten their learning curve. Um, and then just taking time to like unplug, you know. I love that you ended on that one. Have fun, yeah, play. For sure. Yeah, I think it's an under underserved word in today's world. Um, I did some of that this past week and I went, drove to Houston for most people wouldn't consider high rocks fun, uh, but it's this fitness race where you crush yourself. But I was doing it with a couple of my buddies, uh, one of which I, I grew up with my whole life. So it was just like getting to like play and be in the arena. It's, I come back into this week just feeling so fired up. So it's something I, I highly recommend and I love that you ended with that. Um, we always end the same way. The, the first things first is, what are you working on? Like somebody out there that is listening to this and would potentially love to work with you. What's, what's the thing or product or service you're providing right now uh, so that they could reach out to you and then where can they find you at? Yeah, for sure. So I have a coaching program. It's a uh, 90 day coaching program that can extend beyond 90 days if we want to. I mean, everybody I work with, my goal is to help them achieve their first year of, of being alcohol free. So I have a coaching program one-on-one. -on -one. I'm getting ready to launch a group coaching program um, that will probably be a little bit more accessible. So I'm also building out a course to help support that. 
Um, I'm likely going to be bringing in other experts and, and other coaches to support the the growth of the system as well. Um, so you can work with me that way. And you can find my website, www.thestopdrinkingcoach.com. You can find my podcast on Spotify and Apple. Look up Stop Drinking or The Stop Drinking Coach. And my main platform <clears throat> is TikTok, um, at Stop Drinking Coach. You can find me on Instagram, at the stop drinking coach. And, um, I'm just starting to get onto YouTube as well. And this year I'll probably expand into some other platforms, but main platforms right now are, are TikTok and my podcast. I look forward. So when you get continue to expand, this is awesome. Last question I always ask everyone is if you were to define the word thriving, what does it mean to you? Thriving. I think thriving is, is, it's a it's a verb, right? So, or is, or is it an adjective? It's a verb. I, th- I think it's a verb. I think it's I think it's being in a state where you're most connected to your authentic self and feel empowered to create the life that you want. I feel I can sense that from you, which is awesome. It's just you you were talking from the get go of this podcast talking about potential like leaning into your potential and then feeling empowered to lean into that and doing things that empower you to do that to then help empower other people. So I loved your response there. Everybody has a different response. That's why I asked that at the end. It's just beautiful to hear. I always end with my biggest takeaway. I think my biggest takeaway here today was when you were talking about the dysregulation and the trauma and understanding that as a human being, we all have it. When I think about my life, I think for a long time, I pointed fingers at other people, like how could they be a certain way without like pointing the finger at myself, asking myself, how could I be this way? And why am I this way? And once I started going down that path of really just looking in the mirror, like you said, and reflecting like, why am I having seven drinks on a Friday and then waking up and doing the same thing over? But then I'm complaining about, my bills that I have to pay. Right. And I'm spending this money on this alcohol and like just seeing and, and taking ownership over that. So I think if there's one takeaway, I think I took away from this, it's looking back in my life and like reflecting even more on those traumas and how is that showing up even more so in my life and how can I use that to empower myself and empower other people. So I appreciate you dropping by here today, Barty. It was, Thank you, CJ. It was an honor to chat with you. Yeah, pleasure. And I'm looking forward to all the uh, positive things that you continue to do in the world. Till next time, this is CJ Finley with the Thrive On Life podcast. Best thing that you can do for us is share this episode uh, with somebody that you feel it could have a positive impact on. Give us that five-star rating and review, and I will chat with you soon.